And greetings. Happy Thursday. Welcome to the Steve Day Show here live and on demand on Blaze TV radio and podcast alongside Todd Erzin and Aaron McIntyre. I am Steve Dace. Steve Day Show brought to you each day by our good friends at First Cup Coffee Company, the Christian-owned Patriot Coffee Company that also doesn't just share your values, but makes some pretty darn good coffee as well. They put the roast on date right there on the bag. Uh, it is shipped to you within days of being roasted, a flavor for every freedom-loving American. You can't beat it. Try it for yourself by going to firstcup.com or like Aaron, try it again, but this time remember the promo code DACE, firstcup.com, promo code DACE to get 10% off on your order and if you subscribe, you get 10% off. That's an additional 10% for the life of your subscription. Take advantage of this at firstcup.com and use the promo code DACE. Coming up at the bottom of the hour, the return of our good friend, Dr. Ryan Cole. We'll talk about some testimony that he gave recently. Next hour, we're going to wrap up our series on Theology Thursday on Know Thy Enemy. That's the nefarious inspired Bible study that uh, I put together with Dr. Jeremiah Johnston over at Preston Wood Baptist. Uh, kind of a summation of everything we went through with spiritual warfare, although what we're about to talk about will seem like a redundancy, like we're talking about that topic twice, because we are, but more on that in a moment. And maybe the last visit for a while, at least that's what we're hoping, <clears throat> uh, for my oldest daughter for three non-political questions, because she's due to deliver a baby now, any day now. So we're hoping that that, uh, that occurs sooner rather than later. And then she's on maternity leave, so it'll be a bit before we see her. So Aaron, you may have to... Um, retake over this okay. responsibility. Uh, but before we get to all of that, here is the rundown of what happened while we were away. What happened while we were away? Brought to you by SCOTUS. The Supreme Court yesterday agreed to rule on whether Trump enjoys total immunity from prosecution. The question, as you're probably aware, stems from Trump's J6 case brought about by special counsel Jack Smith, where Trump is alleged to have committed various crimes related to the Capitol riot. Trump claims presidential immunity shields him from that prosecution. The court will hear arguments in late April and may not rule until late June. The time frame of the Supreme Court's proceedings could have a chance to throw a wrench into Jack Smith's plans in the D.C. District Court to convict Trump as a felon prior to November's election. Let's take a step back here for one moment and take a look at Trump's major legal cases. In New York, an appeals court judge this week denied a request from Trump to pause enforcement of the $454 million judgment he was ordered to pay in his New York civil fraud case. Trump's classified documents case in Florida continues to churn on this week. Judge Aileen Cannon, probably the most sympathetic judge in any of his cases, denied Trump's legal team's request to access classified documents pertaining to this case. It's unclear how far along that case is overall. And and in Georgia, we've learned far more about Fulton County District Attorney Fannie Willis than we ever wanted to, like the fact she made midnight booty calls to the man she eventually tasked with prosecuting Trump's RICO case down there. So who knows how that case will turn out. Moving on, in Athens, Georgia, Democrat Mayor Kelly Gertz held a press conference where he said his town's sanctuary city status had nothing to do with the brutal murder of Georgia nursing student Lakin Riley at the hands of an illegal alien. He also added that it's actually Donald Trump's fault. 2019 was not that long ago. You might remember the dynamic we were living in in the late teens in this country where you had the president of the United States speaking in the most vile terms about people who were foreign born. And you had that notion metastasizing in places like Charlottesville. In the main, I caution against conflating immigration and crime. The data demonstrates that the two are not connected. Learning Chinese today, today's phrase is, why is there a place called hell? Missouri Attorney General Andrew Bailey has launched a suit against Planned Parenthood for trafficking minors out of state to kill their babies without parental consent. He's also seeking a court order to block the clinic from subjecting children to such treatment. Bailey said in a statement, quote, this is the beginning of the end for Planned Parenthood in the state of Missouri. General Bailey also cited Missouri law prohibiting the trafficking of minors out of state for baby killing, along with a laundry list of ways Planned Parenthood has been incompliant with other relevant Missouri laws. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis signed a bill today which releases the 2006 Florida grand jury files of deceased sex trafficker and pedophile Jeffrey Epstein. This was a deal that was really engineered with the Southern District of Florida, the, the U.S. attorney or the federal uh, the case was not brought federally, which I think there would have been a, a, an ability to do that. Instead, they, they converted it 
into the state, which were the charges were relatively minor, and obviously the punishment was effectively a slap on the wrist given the severity of the crimes. So that has been a, a question I think a lot of people have had. This was something that was really scrutinized uh, at the, the latter part of last decade. I mean, it got a lot of media attention. Uh, clearly, the, the secretary at the time was under pressure, and that, that really uh, caused him um, you know, a lot of problems with remaining in office. So, so, so that's kind of, kind of been vetted uh, on that. And in terms of, and I did say during the uh, during the presidential campaign that uh, the federal Epstein file should be released, and and I was committed to do that. Uh, I would challenge uh, Joe Biden to do that now. Uh, I think a lot of. Uh, these victims would, would appreciate that. Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro unveiled a new election security task force today. Of course, the task force's aim is not security, according to the governor. It's actually making sure misinformation and disinformation doesn't spread about the 2024 election in the Keystone State. And finally, the Babylon Bee had a field day with the news that Mitch McConnell is stepping down as Republican leader in the Senate this November. Like with this headline... Aides forced to cut Mitch McConnell out of six pack of plastic rings again. McConnell acknowledges he's no longer fit to be senator, will keep being senator. Breaking, Ukraine to lose top Republican Senate seat. And this one, McConnell returns to the sea. And that's what happened while we were away. Aaron's Montage brought to you by Constitution Wealth, the Patriots' choice in wealth management. Let me ask you something. Do you avoid shopping at places that hate you? and what you believe in when you can. You can't do that a lot nowadays, but there are places where you can. Well, if you're making that uh, kind of moral choice, why not apply that to your investments and your retirement as well? Um, You can be aligning your investment money with your values via Constitution Wealth. They can help you build a solid investment plan because you still have to retire someday, we hope anyway. Uh, They can reduce your investments in ESG, DEI, and more. Uh, reduce your investments in those work corp- woke corporations that are uh, warping the country and in doing so help you to fight the culture war with your most powerful weapon, your money and your voice. This is your opportunity to help build the parallel economy together by working with an investment firm comprised of professionals who are patriots just like you. Work with an advisor who shares your conservative patriotic values. Why work with anyone else? Just go to constitutionwealth.com slash Steve. Sign up for a free consultation today at constitutionwealth.com slash Steve. Pennsylvania's Democratic governor appointing an election security task force. At this point, you just have to, you just have to laugh to avoid to avoid cutting yourself. I have to tell you, I am, I I am as close to being blackpilled as maybe I have ever been, or at least since the darkest days of the COVID lockdowns. What I am about to lay out to you, I want to be wrong. There are people whose opinions I respect who think I am, and I will explain why I disagree with them. And one of the things we've always tried to do on this show is, you know, I, I used to cite my old algebra teacher, Mr. Judovix, used to tell me I had to show my work, right? That's a big thing on our show. We, we walk you through data and, and why we come up to the conclusions we have. And then you draw your own conclusions about ours. You may look at the same data set and come to a different conclusion. That's okay. All right. I mean, uh, the guy I have edit all of my content is Catholic. I'm not. All right? So th- people of, 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 of goodwill, virtue, credibility, integrity are going to differ on things. All right? And nothing wrong with a little come now, let us reason together every now and then. Amen? Amen. So by and large, let me walk you through my thought process. And if you then want to take it to someone else in our industry or movement who disagrees... You know, see if they're also showing their work. Like, for example, today, there's an awful lot of people on the right, I've noticed, particularly the so-called dissident right, that have generated a hell of a bunch of clicks and engagement for themselves commenting on Jeffrey Epstein, right? Yeah. Quiet as kept many of them are today, though, now that Governor DeSantis is releasing the initial Epstein files down there in Florida. Find out weird how that works. That way. You see what I'm saying? Weird. Yeah. See, that's the stuff you need to be, uh, you need to look out for. Okay. Quiet is kept now that it's actually going down on some level anyway. 
So I'm not saying what I'm about to lay out for you is right, but after walking through this myself yesterday afternoon, and then with several people whose opinions I respect who know more about this stuff than me, like our good friend Josh Hammer, for example, who used to be a clerk on the U.S. Court of Appeals for Judge Ho, okay, uh, I'm... Even though Josh doesn't agrees with most of what I'm about to show you, and not all, he hasn't. No one has shown me anything that, it, that and I'm going to explain why at the end. Why, I am convinced this is what is going down. Let me start though by reiterating the following: We are not a nation of laws, and we never have been. We are a nation of political will, and we always will be. Laws do not enforce themselves. Rules do not enforce themselves. We talked about this yesterday as it relates to the, the ballot harvesting <clears throat> turnout machine Democrats have, correct? Mm-hmm. All right. So let me walk you through a timetable here. For example, some of the headlines you guys are seeing, and I saw them too, are making it sound as if the court is actually granting Trump's appeal. That's actually not even correct news. I mean, this is right from the, the a motion. I'll just read it to you. The application for a stay presented to the chief justice is referred by him to the court. The special counsel's request to treat the stay application as a petition for a writ of cert is granted. And that petition is granted limited to the following question. Whether and if so, to what extent does a former president enjoy immunity from criminal prosecution for conduct alleged to involve official acts during his tenure in office? Whose motion did it say right there they're granting? Smith's. Smith's, the special counsel's. That's what I just read you. Special counsel's request to treat the stay application as a petition for writ of certiori is granted. They're, they're responding to Jack Smith. They have circumvented Trump's appeal defense process by doing this I want to walk you through a timeline of events so you understand where I am coming from because when I first saw this I actually thought it was good news it's funny if you look at my Twitter feed I'm first reacting to this and I think it's good news and then I read the memo oh no this is in response to Jack Smith then I start contemplating what's going on so at the end of last year, recall, Jack Smith tried to go to, go, to, go to the Supreme Court immediately for the court to render a verdict on whether or not a president has full and complete immunity, essentially forever, no matter what, for whatever he did in office after he leaves office. Right? Remember that? Yes. And I thought for sure Smith would not have made that motion and try to circumvent the appeal process unless he was pretty confident how the, it was going to go. And so I was stunned, actually, on December 23rd when um, the court told him, no, they will not expedite it. Okay. But we were on vacation at the time. We had already gone to Christmas vacation, so we weren't here to comment on it. On February 14th, so... Trump appealed this question. Judge Chutkin, I think is how it's pronounced, or Shutkin, in, in the D.C. court, the Obama acolyte, ruled against him that he doesn't have absolute immunity. He appealed to the Court of Appeals that oversees the D.C. Circuit Court. And a panel, there's I think 11 or 12 justices on that court, three of the justices heard it initially. His appeal, they ruled against it in mid-February, unanimously. And in that ruling, they noted, remember, we cited, we mentioned this on the air at the time, this was just a few weeks ago. In that ruling, they noted that Bill Clinton faced a post-office penalty for the act of committing perjury while in office. He lied under oath to Ken Starr's grand jury. And that Bill Clinton, as a result of that, had to give up his law license and pay a fine. So this idea that there is no precedent is the argument that the court was making. The idea that there's no precedent for a president ever being held accountable for their acts in office after they leave office is not true. In fact, there's a recent precedent was their argument. And then they, in that ruling, they told Trump not to even bother trying to appeal this to the full court. He would lose. And they only gave him six days to file an appeal. Clearly, they were trying to expedite this process, right? We, yes. we talked about this at the time. I recommended, as many others did, though, that Trump should appeal to the full court 
even if you're going to lose, just to try to work. This is, this is a race against the clock, both sides right now, okay? And the longer this goes on, the slower the pace is, the better it is for Trump and, frankly, for the rest of us for this election. And so that's what they did. They, they made a motion to appeal to the full court of, of the D.C. Court of Appeals. Jack Smith filed a motion on February 14th to circumvent Trump's appeal process, trying again to speed this up again. To go right to the Supreme Court and say, answer the question, does a president have complete, full, and total and absolute immunity? For whatever they did in office, the only means of holding a president accountable is the term limits in the Constitution, the election process, or the impeachment process. No matter, molestation, open treason, no matter what, nothing a president does that, 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 that is, is, is in violation of this immunity. All right? It is to this motion now that the court granted standing. Not to Trump's appeal, to this motion. Trump wants this to go to the the district court, the full court, take another month or two doing that, okay? And then maybe we're well into this term and the Supreme Court doesn't issue an opinion on whether it's going to take up the case by the end of this term for the Supreme Court, which expires on June 30th. And then you've, you've essentially run out the clock. That's what Trump wants. So Jack Smith tried again in, on Valentine's Day what he did in December. T- yesterday, the court agreed with him. Oral arguments will take place on April 22nd. This is, we're almost like Bush v. Gore. This is not quite that fast, but this is pretty fast. April 22nd, oral arguments will take place. The Supreme Court um, term ends June 30. So there'll be a ruling at least by then. Now, I think the court and everybody that I talk to who doesn't yet, who doesn't quite agree with the conclusion I'm about to give you agrees with me up to this point. The court took this case for the purposes of clarifying the definition of presidential immunity. Who's begging the question? Jack Smith is. When, when, when the court took up the Dobbs case in Mississippi, go back and w- listen to our show at that time. And you'll hear us say, we didn't, we didn't even contemplate this could be used to overturn Roe. We didn't think it would go that far yet. But none of us thought they would take up that case to then rule against us. That's what's happening here. Trump's going to lose. They're only taking up the question to clarify the question. They said to Jack Smith, you're asking the right question. This thing needs to be clarified. So we grant you cert. Just like they they granted cert to Mississippi in the Dobbs case to hear, should there be legal limits on abortion? They granted cert to Hobby Lobby to hear, should there be, uh, you know, uh, should you uh, be able to be penalized as a company for your Christian beliefs? Or to masterpiece the cake, the cake baker, Jack, they granted him cert. Should you just continually be persecuted? The odds are very high this is going to go against Trump. I saw even Jonathan Turley say this yesterday. And if it does, that I mean, Trump's entire argument is that immunity is without exception. They're going to clarify things, which means there's exceptions, more than likely. Now, here is where things get into the gray area. And everybody that I talk to or follow whose opinions I respect on this, for the most part, agrees with what I'm thinking up until this point. Let's say the court doesn't give a ruling on this until June 30th. Is that enough time to put a trial and everything into place? See, this is where you're thinking of this as a legal proceeding that this is a legal proceeding for the intent of having a political outcome. I don't agree with that. I think this is a political proceeding with the intent of having a legal outcome. This is an assassination. But it needs to be officially sanctioned. It needs to be seen as legitimate. 
the normies need to be assuaged. Well, I mean, they went through the process. Trump got to appeal at the Supreme Court. You see what I'm saying? This is not a legal process with the intent of garnering a specific political outcome. It is a political process with the intent of generating a specific legal outcome. I got two texts last week. Friends of mine, people I know. Former University of Iowa football player Siaka Massacoy. He was in that Lady Ballers movie for Daily Wire. He goes out, I think it was to Nashville for their premiere late last year. Flies back home to Burbank, gets off the plane. You ever been to the Burbank airport, by the way, even though it's a beautiful city, you don't, you actually, you, you still land on the tarmac like back in the day and walk to the gate. They don't have the air bridges out there, okay? And so you land, you walk down the, the thing, the stairs of the plane like you used to back way back in the day. And you, you get out, he walks out with his family, walks down the stairs. The feds are waiting there for him to arrest him in front of a full plane, humiliate him. He texted me this week. You're not going to believe this out of nowhere. They're trying to move my trial date up. So they're going to make sure to try me before the election, just in case they lose. Let's get closer to home. Our colleague, Steve Baker. Did the feds just find out that Steve Baker was there on January 6th as an independent journalist they recording the event. Did, was this breaking news to them in the last week? No. No, in fact, they've been doing a dance for months. Get ready to surrender, don't. 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 And then out of nowhere, when they didn't respond for weeks, suddenly they're able to move and ready to move just like that. They got all the ducks, ducks in a row. You see where I'm going with this? Sometimes I wonder, do we believe our own talking points on our side? You know, I said here all of last year, making points like, what is the plan for when they attempt to put Trump in prison? What is the plan for when they take, start taking him off the ballot? We were sitting here as, I went back and looked, it was as early as April of last year we were going through these, some, these, these scenarios, screaming about him. And I'm sitting here, you know, you got, you got this grift core of people, you know, they're, they're, and, and I agree with that. What's ironic is I actually agree with their talking points. I'm, t- I'm wondering if they do, is it, or is it just a talking point for an engagement? Because a lot of them are the same people that are silent about releasing the Epstein files today suddenly when they couldn't get enough of the story before, but now that DeSantis is doing it, they're quiet as kept. So again, maybe it's a game. I don't think this is a game. I think the Boar Queen is looking at us and say, come, watch your futures end. That's what I think's happening. Maybe I'm one of the few around here that actually takes this crap seriously. Maybe it's a game. Maybe we're not serious. Lo and behold, we get, we get into the fall, start trying to take Trump off ballots. First, they start talking about it on cable news. Then they try doing it. So let me try this again. Do we really believe they are going to go through all of this and on June 30th, the Supreme Court is going to say absolute immunity does not apply to this. And then these people, the embodiment of the spirit of the age, they're going to, they're going to have a JFK and Dealey Plaza shot at Donald Trump. And they're going to look at the court docket, guys, and they're going to say, oh, shucks, clerical overload. We just can't make it work. Who believes this? And see, this is where I'm going to do. This is where I'm going to break ranks. Name me a single time the last few years. Process and procedure has stopped these people on anything. One. I'll wait. Go. Go, guys. Go. Can you think of one? Give me one. One? No? No. Hell no, they're not going to do that. They don't care if the gavel in the trial, the morning of the election. Hey, this will pay back for the Comey letter last time. Just one more, uh, one more reminder that uh, Trump's a criminal here. So, you know, here's your, here's your video. Do we even listen to our own talking points? Do we even believe our own stories? I absolutely do not believe. And this is why I'm blackpilled. I want, I'm close to it. I want to be wrong. But I have not seen process and procedure stop these people at all.
Process and procedure didn't stop them from deciding they got to put my buddy Siaka Masakoy on trial. Stat. Process and procedure ain't getting in the way of making Steve Baker report tomorrow, is it? No. No. I, I, I do not understand the mind. I'm trying because I think there are smart people who think this. I don't understand the conclusion. Now, if you think the Supreme Court's going to rule in Trump's favor, well, that's a different conversation then, and that makes all of this moot at that point. Everything's off, right? Okay, cool. But if they're not, so the Supreme Court's going to rule in Jack Smith's favor, and then Jack Smith's going to check his iPhone, well, go on his uh, cozy app for his calendar, whatever his calendar app is. You know, oh, man. Well, crap. <sighs> Well, we ran out of time, guys, and report back to the DNC. I'm sorry, the DOJ, and just say, <sighs> turn his pockets out. I got nothing for you. We're out of time, and I guess you'll just have to beat old Cheeto Jesus the old-fashioned way. Who believes this? Well, apparently a lot of people do. I don't. And that's why my opinion differs. I do not think... This is a legal proceeding with the intent of generating a political outcome. It is a political proceeding with the intent of generating a legal outcome. They need permission to fire the shot. They're going to likely get it. And I don't think there's any way after upon receiving it, they're not going to pull the trigger. Please tell me I'm wrong. Did I lay this out? Yeah, I get it. I guess the question, is there anything outside of the lawfare that you foresee in the actual, in as far as it still exists, the actual political arena? Because this is political, that could alter what you just laid out. That that you could possibly foresee. I mean, not some... Yes. Yeah. Well, then you threw in the caveat I could possibly foresee. Republicans would have to shut the government down and say, we are not opening the government back up until you accept a budget deal that defunds Jack Smith and the independent counsel's office. That is the the only political process I, I can foresee that would stop this. I don't... I don't so, I, it won't stop. Got it. Now, if, now there is a legal process. The court, I could be wrong, and the court could rule in Trump's favor. I don't think the odds of that are very high, frankly. But I've been wrong before. I, we, we all sat here. Well, you guys weren't here working at the time, but I remember we were doing our show the night of the oral arguments for Obamacare in 2012 and playing that clip uh, with even uh, Jeffrey Lubin. Even Jeffrey Lubin was on TV saying he was he was demoralized. Obamacare is dead. Listening to these questions, we th- we all thought Obamacare was dead. Everybody that listened to those oral arguments thought it was dead. John Roberts resurrected it not once but twice that year. You know, so I've been wrong. I, I've been wrong before. I could be wrong about this, but politically, to answer your question, the only remedy is Republicans in Congress would have to say we're not accepting a budget deal, no matter how long the government shut down. That doesn't entail the defunding of the Department of Justice, specifically Jack Smith's. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, inquiry never happened is intifada against Trump unlike the Supreme Court my understanding is that the district court for DC which is where the J6 case has originated Trump then appealed to the US Circuit Court for DC uh, they said no and so now we're at the Supreme Court which is not again they're not hearing Trump's appeal they're hearing Jack Smith's um, request from from not that long ago So let's say they make their decision at the latest possible moment, the end of June, okay? I've done a little bit of research during this segment. It's really hard to figure out ballot access questions um, state by state because of various- Like when they get printed, when when early voting starts. But I did do a little bit of of research and it's on, on a couple of states. This is all I was able to find. Wisconsin, the deadline, I believe is September 3rd. In, in uh, Pennsylvania, it is, I believe, October is the deadline to withdraw. So, I'm sorry, it's August, actually. August, middle of August in Pennsylvania is the deadline to withdraw. I don't like so where any still, of this is going. I still, they still have at least a couple of months.
there is one more big dot I need to connect for you on what we were just discussing uh, from the Supreme Court decision to take up the immunity case yesterday. Uh, We'll get to that at the top of the next hour before we delve into Theology Thursday, because I think it's actually going to be a a good segue uh, to our our Theology Thursday conclusion, looking at the nefarious Bible study, Know Thy Enemy. But let's welcome back first a good friend of the program, Dr. Ryan Cole is here with us. It is good to see you again, brother. How How are you? Uh, doing great. Uh, always good to be with you, Steve. Thank you. Um, I, I heard about some, uh, I've seen some of the testimony you've been given, giving specifically just a couple days ago on February 26th. And I said to Todd, hey, we have to get you back and, and have some discussions about what's going on, what you've seen, what you've been through, given what you told us the, the last time you were here. In fact, let's start there, Ryan. Um, I mean, they have tried to go after you, discredit you, take your medical license and everything away. Where is that fight at as we stand here today on February 29th? Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to give the update. First, I want to extend extreme gratitude to you and to many of the listeners that have uh, been of help. You know, we're, we're battling still. We're in the appeals court process at the moment. Uh, Washington didn't take my license, but they restricted it. But the entire hearing in and of itself was unconstitutional. So as you guys do on a daily basis, fighting for the truth and the rule of law, and we know, as you say many a time, we're only a nation of the will of law, you know, our will to apply the law. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm in that appeals process. Uh, I'm optimistic. I have some good attorneys working on it, uh, both uh, locally, regionally and nationally. So I think we may end up in the Supreme Court as well. This is a matter of free speech and which kind of segues into what I was talking about in the Senate the other day. But at the same time, uh, extreme gratitude. Thank you. Well, it's well earned and deserved. And as I recall, I want to make sure I get these details correct. Your case did not delve from a complaint from a patient, some act of malfeasance that, and I mean, I, I mean, let's start there. I stop there for a second and clarify something. How many people did you consult or treat with or treat during COVID? Around 400, All right, mo- that, mostly local, but some online and, and, and many nationally. So in the hundreds, no one filed a complaint alleging Correct. malfeasance based on treatment or consultation of treatment. So this was not about the your professional practice, but all about the fact that you were coming on shows like this and sharing data and evidence from your practice and what you had seen and with your, you know, Mayo educated knowledge as a pathologist. And therefore you were confronting the narrative of the spirit of the age And that's what this is about, not your actual behavior or performance as a physician. Absolutely correct, Steve. No patient complaints, no medical care complaints. This was all about speech. And then they then they open up with their uh, self-appointed unconstitutional fourth branch of the government administrative state authorities to delve into anything and everything you've ever done. And when did you sneeze wrong? And when did you walk across the street incorrectly? It's an absurdity that we're up against. But you are correct. No patients complained. Uh, A lot of this was from a local CEO of a hospital, Dr. David Pate. Uh, He put him uh, upon himself and he walked away with millions upon millions of dollars for being the COVID are for the local hospital as a bonus uh, and attacking me in every state I was licensed, et cetera, uh, because he didn't like what I was saying. Maybe I was threatening the bottom line of the hospital getting their millions. I don't know. But at the end of the day, one man, a newspaper reporter here locally and a couple of other uh, people that he induced to complain. So these were induced complaints uh, over free speech. And at the end of the day, you know, the irony in all of this is here I am paying the price for it. And I was right. Hmm. Where are we at with this now in the aftermath? And I, I go back to um, when the, the when the government, when the feds initiated their covid vaccine mandate in on September 7th of 2021. And from that time forward, given the amount of coercion that was going to go into making people take these shots and they ended up getting 85 percent of adults in America to take at least one dose of them that essentially we were now at the stage that all of us are an experiment in real time, that we knew neither the long-term ramifications of even asymptomatic exposure to a virus likely of malicious, if not at least questionable origin, um, but certainly a natural origin to uh, this form of technology that has never been mass injected into human beings before. And so 
um, we're now coming up on two and a half years since I made those statements. You are following the data. You're looking at patients. What are you seeing? Where are we with all of this? Well, Ed, as you know, you were right all along as well. And so the Fourth Reich, as, as you've called it in your excellent book, they're still trying to suppress data. Uh, a major paper was just retracted the other day uh, for the same reasons. Uh, third parties that have no experience in epidemiology, et cetera, uh, retracted a paper by Jessica Rose and others that, that was an exceedingly Jessica Rose paper. is interviewed in Rise of the Fourth Reich, by the way. Pardon me, but go ahead. Yes. Yeah, she's fantastic. I saw her in D.C. in the Senate hearing this weekend. So, you know, the trends are continuing. The This was a gene injection. This was never a vaccine. Never, never will an mRNA technology be a vaccine. They're registered through their Security and Exchange Commission filings as gene therapies in Moderna and Pfizer's filings. So people have received a gene injection. We don't know the long-term effects of those. Usually the FDA will study those from anywhere from 5 to 10 to 15 years before authorizing a, a gene product onto the market, and there's only a handful that ever have made it that far. So now we're starting to see this train wreck in slow motion that's obviously tragic in terms of the statistical outcomes, be it neurologic harms. Everybody hears about myocarditis. But neurologic harms are even higher. And, uh, you know, the cancer trends that I saw, sadly, are continuing. I'm consulting with a friend today who's coming over just to ask for some coaching because the hospitals have said, look, we have nothing else for you. And so every day, every day in the news, you hear of another actor that has this unpredictable why, why did they get this thing and, and why are they doing so poorly or this 40 year old or that 40 year old dying from a heart attack uh, so the, the the data is overwhelming at this point really what we need to do is continue to fight for this free speech to talk about it without threat of repercussion for just sharing data I mean think about Galileo historically what did they do when he uh, upended the story of the solar system they threw him in the tower it's no different what happened to Zimmelweis why do we wash our hands today? Because of Zimmelweis. What did all of his colleagues do to him back in the Austro-Hungarian? Had him uh, committed. Empire? Yeah. Yeah, had him committed. Yeah, where he, he, died, he died in you know, a sanatorium, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's no different. Um, obviously, there's big money, big power, big funding behind what's attacking the medical uh, truth tellers and uh the journalists like you, the uh, truth tellers all around the world, they want us silenced. And that's that's not constitutional, at least in America. And it was great actually being in the U.S. Senate under that hearing with Senator Johnson. There were individuals there from the Netherlands, from Switzerland, from Romania. And I, I want to commend the Romanians, the Croatians, the Hungarians. They're the ones that actually have recently been under communism. They, they stood up. They marched in their streets. The Austrians did as well. They're, they're are the ones that set example the example for us and i brought up in that that up in my words and in, in my brief uh, moments in the senate hearing the other day why, why is it that the eastern europeans are rebelling like we did against king george back in the 1770s why why do we have to look distantly for an example when we have the foundational principles of the most free nation on earth here and yet we're being schooled by those that are saying you you guys are on a primrose path to hell and indeed we are as a nation if we continue to act in the way we are can we talk the med the medical aspect of this for a second the treatment aspect of this if you don't mind for a few minutes um i i continue to get questions from people you know i i took the jab i didn't want to um or i've got a loved one who took it and took boosters and i want to help them are there ways We've discussed with others, people like, you know, like Dr. Peter McCullough and others in, in the last year or so, but what's the latest on ways to purge that spiked protein from from your body? I mean, it's funny now, they're even, they're admitting now, you know, when I did a parody Christmas song about the shot not staying in your arm, if if I had said that unironically, I did, at the, in December of 21, I'd been banned from every major platform in the country, and they're admitting it now. They're admitting the shot doesn't stay in your arm; it goes into your whole bloodstream. They're admitting they, they're admitting they don't, they don't know how long it stays there. So, is there a way to detox from this spiked protein? 
Yeah, and that's a term that I don't tend to use because, again, this was a gene-based product. Uh, one of the speakers, Kevin McKernan, preliminary studies, we're still waiting to repeat it, but there's been some other lab studies that there is indication that genetically part of the sequence can integrate into our own DNA, mm. or at least in cell mm. at least in cell cultures. So to detox from a gene, uh, not known, not known. Hopefully inactivating a gene is what we would like to be able to do. Can you block the effects of the spike protein? Yes. Did Dr. Brogna in Europe in his study show that in half of individual spike protein still circulating six months? Yes, he did. And, and that was when he published the paper. So it may actually persist even longer. And that was proven to be vaccinal spike protein. We can look at certain uh, amino acids and show that it's Moderna or Pfizer versus a natural infection. So uh, optimizing health is the simplest thing, losing the weight, getting away from the processed food in our American diet. Uh, fasting, intermittent fasting turns over our, our immune cells. Everybody knows me for early on talking about the importance of vitamin D, especially since we're only about three quarters of the way through winter. Um, there, there are medications that will block the effects of spike protein. Uh, other viruses have activated in some individuals. Some people's fatigue is from reactivated Epstein-Barr virus, mono, mono. You know, everybody remembers the kissing disease in high school or college. So there's so many things. It's, it's not just one easy answer. But I, I, I think there's been an awakening in the sense that people realize they have to take care of their own body and become their own best doctor at this point because the, the, the system is broken, as we all know, and you only have a few minutes with your doctor. Uh, don't I mean, don't be afraid. There's a lot of good doctors out there. Don't be afraid of your doctor per se, but also never go near the gene juice. And uh, even just watching the CDC recommend that elderly should get another boot booster for something that doesn't exist anymore. And it's still absurd how captured the system is, but you do need to take care of your own health. There's there's no easy answer. I've been working on a book. I've, I've been just battling through the dark ages of winter trying to get that done here. But it, but the book is, so I took the shots, now what? And I'll go through a lot of those things in the book. I, I thought I'd have it done a month ago. I don't. Maybe by the end of this month I will. Or March, not now. We're, we're at the end of this month. But, but anyway, um, there's not an easy answer, and it's not a one-size-fits-all, because a lot of the physical conditions people are experiencing may be from different effects, depending on where in the body that spike protein landed. Well, if it's a gene therapy, it. everybody's genetics are unique to them, right? So... Hundred percent. Yeah, hundred percent. And some people. So every, are everybody's fine. a control group, which means nobody is basically. Yeah. Correct. Absolutely correct. Yeah. That's a pretty scary proposition, actually. And I don't mean I don't mean to be Eeyore or <laughs> Debbie Downer here, but I'm just being scientifically honest. That's you know that's the challenge in all of this. I I, I see the human tragedy that's happened, and my heart goes out to everybody. And again, a lot of people were doing the right thing at the right time in their mind, but being gaslit into doing it or being coerced into doing it, not having it informed consent into doing it. And I think that's woken a lot of people up. That's that's another optimistic point here. A lot of people are awake to the shenanigans of an overreaching government. And so in that sense, as much as people are suffering, at least we're awake enough to not repeat this mistake, I would hope. Unfair final question, because we could do an entire segment on just this, but I'd be remiss if I didn't ask if you know, I've only got a couple of minutes left, but I'm getting lots of questions from young mothers, expectant mothers. Should should this call into question even the traditional childhood vaccination schedule that I took as a kid? Um, is this a unique process because of the uniqueness of the lipid nanoparticles and then mRNA? I know you're getting a lot more of these questions than I am, of course. So what, what do you say to expectant moms now? And young mothers. Uh, uh, I had all my childhood shots. I had military shots. Uh, the... Again, the good news is that we know more now. You can read books like Turtles All the Way Down, Vaccine Science and Vaccine Myth. Uh, some of these diseases, some of these vaccines traditional in developing nations, look, they see a lot of these diseases, congenital rubella and tetanus. And I have a good colleague, Dr. Milhone, who does mission work around the world. And he sees, sadly, a lot of these vaccine preventable diseases. It doesn't mean we need them here in a hygienic, uh, developed Western world, per se. 
It's an individual decision, obviously. Am I skeptical of the childhood vaccine schedule? Oh, absolutely. Is there any reason for any child to get the, what is it, 72 or 73 shots now for 17 types of vaccines? Absolutely not. So it's an individual decision, but I would encourage people to be skeptical, do your research, make your own private decision, and optimize your health first. I mean, if you're if you're going into something and, and you don't have good health uh, or a low vitamin D level, uh, your vaccines won't work anyway. So uh, I'm highly, highly skeptical of most vaccines now because I've seen the data and I I just, uh, now I'm a non-believer in those as well. I'm a believer in things above us, but not not most that's coming from man now. So I think one has to be skeptical. One has to be prudent. Do your own research. Uh, there will be some chapters in future books on that as well. But it's, it's not an easy decision because I know the pressure from the pediatricians. Most of them are, are woke and uh, bought into, most of their income comes from giving vaccines or a high percentage does, not not most, but a high percentage of their income. They're incentivized to, to vaccinate. Their, their income is dependent on something. And, and again, that leads to coercion. So I think these pregnant moms need to be careful and know their own health, know their own, um, personal medical history and be very, very cautious and careful. It, it is, it's, it's a multivariable equation that's not easy to uh, find the answer to sometimes, but I think standing up for your principle uh, in this day and age matters almost more than anything. Well, you have been a great example of that, brother. Thank you very much. God bless you. And uh, when you get that book finished and it's out, let us know and we'll make sure to have you on because we definitely want to discuss it. Okay. God bless you and the team. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you. Dr. Ryan Cole. An absolute dude. Thoughts on that conversation? Well, thank you for asking uh, that last question. I I thought he answered that incredibly fairly. Listen, while I've talked about the being an anti-vaxxer, I'm fully vaxxed. Uh, I'm just like most people are. And my parents are just like most people are. So I get it. And it, it, you know, there's in terms of traditional vaccination, we don't have the metrics like when Steve laid out in VAERS and, and uh, the um, the specific COVID reporting system for injuries. But the biggest way we... There certainly are injuries, undeniable injuries that they've lied about. But the biggest injury has been to our ability to lie to ourselves beyond the notion of COVID. This how we've deified experts, period. Yes. Medicine, period. So we, we just... We drink it all, even even though they're the most educated we've ever been in society. That's the biggest disease, and that's why we fell for this. When we come back, I want to put a bow on the conversation about what the Supreme Court did yesterday. And it will actually be a good segue into what we're going to talk about with Theology Thursday next. Let's get to an hour two underway here on Blaze TV radio and podcast. Steve Dace alongside Todd Erz and Aaron McIntyre, all of you. Let us know what you think about what we think. Steve at SteveDace.com is how you can email us, D-E-A-C-E. Like us on Facebook, Me, We, and Gab. Follow me at Steve Dace Show, Twitter, Gitter, Instagram, and TikTok. If you like the show and you haven't yet done so, heck, even if you have, do it again. Leave us a five-star review, please, and uh, hit subscribe, or if you're on iTunes, follow. That way, every time we do a new episode, it'll show up in your feed every single time. And we want to thank all of you that have done those things for us already. I also want to thank our friends over at Relief Factor. Uh, they sponsor this part of the show, uh, and they, they know that pain is your body's way of letting you know something is wrong. Uh, Most of the time, what it's trying to tell you is you've got too much inflammation in your joints. Uh, Those aches and pains you feel that linger throughout the day, that stiffness, achiness, soreness that doesn't go away, mostly due to inflammation. And that's where relief factor comes in. You can take drugs that will help you mask the pain, and they can work. Sometimes they can also, though, give you side effects you don't want. And that's why a group of physicians got together. And they can prescribe drugs too, but they got together to create Relief Factor uh, because they wanted to create a supplement, a drug-free supplement that will attack the inflammation causing your pain. 70% of the people who try it order more because they see a difference in just three weeks or less with the three-week quick start. 
And that's just 20 bucks, by the way. What do you got to lose? 20 bucks to see if you don't see a difference in three weeks or less when you go to relieffactor.com. They have the feel better or your money back guarantee. So now you really have nothing to lose. Relieffactor.com. Again, relieffactor.com. All right. I want to go back and double back to what I was laying out about the Supreme Court and what it did yesterday and where I think this is going to go. And I know it may seem odd now, but it's actually going to be a good segue into spiritual warfare because I, I don't believe human elements can concoct a plot like this. I mean, let me tell you, what, when, when, when human ele- elements try it, you end up with stuff like somebody always rats. Somebody always colors outside the lines. Somebody always goes too far. Somebody always says, well, I, you know, I, I wanted that position instead. Okay. And, 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 you know, goes game of game of Thrones, JV team. This is human nature, right? And that's what Colorado did last year. And you can see they were clearing, clearly laying out a plan. All right. We arraign him, we indict him, we try him, we convict him. And then we, then we beg the question, should we have convicts on the ballot in America? Right. It's pretty obvious. All of a sudden, Colorado's like, well, wait, me, 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 jumps out, no due process at all, and takes Trump off the ballot and puts out a legal brief explaining their actions with basically because orange man bad. That was literally their legal justification. Nothing else. That actually ties into what's going to happen here, I believe. Remember, I don't believe this is a legal proceeding with the intent of of generating a political outcome. It is a political proceeding with the intent of generating a legal outcome. They want an order, a kill order. That's what they're asking for. We want permission to effectively assassinate our opposition. So it's legit. And here's what I think they're going to do. This is a very highly politicized court. John Roberts is basically, when he opens his mouth, Mitch McConnell's words come out. Institutionalist at heart. John Roberts did not want to overturn Obamacare in an election. So what he did is he went against the testimony that the Obama administration attorneys gave the court at the time when they said that the mandate was not a tax because they're running for president. And they don't want to be on the hook for the biggest tax increase of the middle class in American history. That's not, you know, that's not going to get you reelected, right? right? So they went to the Supreme Court and said the mandate wasn't a tax. Well, if it's not a tax, how in the world is it constitutional? It's not. And so guess what John Roberts had to do to save Obamacare? He had to reinvent the testimony of the Obama administration attorneys and rule that it was a tax anyway. That's exactly what happened, guys. That is exactly what happened. He ruled that it was a tax anyway. And therefore, that's the 16th Amendment, right? The federal income tax. And therefore, under the 16th Amendment, basically, governments can do to you whatever they want. They did this again a couple of years later. Because a bunch of these red states... Their governors weren't implementing the Obamacare exchanges. And the legislation said it had to be imposed by a state exchange. Otherwise, it'd be in violation of the 10th Amendment. And so when a bunch of these red states did not implement it, the feds came in and implemented it themselves. And so they were sued. Hey, you're in violation of your own law and the 10th Amendment. If the feds are implementing something, it cannot be a state exchange, right? Mm Mm-hmm. They completely rewrote, Roberts completely rewrote the definition of state exchange to save it twice. By the way, who wrote the original roadmap that Roberts followed to save Obamacare the first time that it was a tax? Do you guys know who wrote that at the court of appeals level? Take a guess. Who wrote it? Just pick, a, pick a judge. Give me a name. Sotomayor. Brett Kavanaugh. Yeah, oh, nice. Yeah, Brett, Brett Kavanaugh actually wrote that original blueprint, and Roberts followed it to save Obamacare. Isn't, can't you, isn't this this is the one great? This is just just one lovely unibrow we all, you know, rub an itch on our temp, on our temples and foreheads. Okay, one just happy unibrow. 
who's on the Supreme Court now? Brett Kavanaugh. With John Roberts. Yeah. And we went to the mattresses for him. Two years ago, we had something that never occurred in American history. A Supreme Court ruling was leaked to the media in advance of its release. Who was busted for that? Nobody. Who was who was found to be guilty of that? Nobody. Nobody. Absolutely nobody. My theory has always been the Chief Justice can't arrest himself. I think he did this to pressure the other justices who were going to overturn Roe. Hey, you're going too far. At the very least... The minor, one of the, somebody in, in the offices of one of the minority justices did it to pressure them, and John Roberts protected them. That's, that's the lowest common denominator of what occurred. This idea they can't find out who leaked the Supreme Court opinion, but there's never been a Supreme Court opinion leaked before, seems to indicate they got a pretty good you know, chain of evidence on those uh, cotton-picking Supreme Court opinions, right? Been a republic for about 250 years. This has never happened before. No, we seem to be pretty good at it. We keep rounding up J6ers left and right. Can't find this dude. I yeah, mean, we, we found Siakam Asakoy on a tarmac yeah. in Burbank, California, yeah. flying all the way from Nashville, Tennessee. Yeah, exactly. So it's never happened before, which seems to indicate they got a pretty good, they got that process on lockdown. Hard to believe it would happen on maybe the most high profile precedent overturning since Brown versus Board of Education overturned Plessy versus Ferguson. And that was another century ago. Pretty Given the momentousness of this case, and it just so happens to be the one where it gets leaked and no one's found, at the very least, John Roberts is protecting them. I think he's protecting himself. I think he leaked it. So here's what I think is going to happen. Because again, this is not a legal process with the intent of creating a political outcome. It's a political process with the intent of creating a legal outcome. What's going to happen here, I believe, is John Roberts... He's going to split the baby in half. He's going to go full Pontius Pilate here. Colorado is going to get pimped slapped. Harder than strawberry on a street corner in South Central tonight. Hard. Might even be 9 nothing. Might even be 9 nothing. Possible. And then he's going to turn around and do the exact same thing to Donald Trump. Probably won't be 9 nothing. It'll be at least 6-3. Maybe 7-2. to two. I'll do it in Ditch McConnell voice because they're basically the same guy. Uh, this protects the integrity of the institutions. We have uh, reined in the, uh, the, the ridiculous fringes of both sides to uh, protect Ukraine. I'm sorry, uh, to uh, protect the corn. Colorado clearly went too far. And so is President Trump. And so it'll be sold to normie America as an equal verdict. Maybe it is, legally, but we're not having a legal process, gentlemen, are we? We're having a political one. And politically, they're not going to be equal at all. One's an assassination order. The other is not. Both legal documents, both legal processes, all processes and procedures were followed, correct? Correct. Same panel, but they're not legal proceedings. They're political ones. And the political ramifications of one will be way more catastrophic than the other that won't be catastrophic at all. But they'll be linked together. Just like Hunter Biden is linked together. Like every time they're about to indict Trump, there's more charges for Hunter Biden. That's not it. Do you think that's a coincidence? And that's why I'm as close to being blackpilled as I ever have been.
let me say finally before we tra- transition this to Theology Thursday. Although I would argue I've been giving you some theology. We've been studying spiritual warfare and the, act, the, the, the demonic realm for the last six weeks. We've been doing it for the last hour on this show, too. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Okay. But uh, this is really not a good place for any people to be. Essentially, the two arguments being presented are that a president can molest a child, rape someone. We could catch Joe Biden literally cutting deals with the Shycoms to hand over American sovereign territory on tape. But if there aren't enough Democrats in the Senate who are willing to remove him, he just walks forever and nothing happens. I don't know that anybody wants to live in a country where that is the case. But before you take that position and say that that doesn't seem like justice to me, Steve, understand what the cost of that position will be. The cost of that position will be if we open this door, then there can be Fannie Willis's and Letitia James for the rest of our lives. That will just find ways to advance their careers, their own ambitions. I mean, Judge Tutkin there in D.C. is auditioning to be on the Supreme Court is what's going on right now. And they can just use this lawfare process to hound whomever we elect. Maybe next time it won't be an Icarus-like candidate like Trump who doesn't just fly too close to the sun maliciously, or, or, or I should say naively, he enjoys it, Okay. He likes being in the gray. Maybe next time it'll be a friggin' Boy Scout. No matter. Precedent will be set. Hey, we didn't like the ruling on this, didn't like the ruling on that. We'll come up with something. Just hound your ass forever. And all of your, and everybody in your administration. Do we want that precedent either? It appears we don't care. Uh, because I got to tell you, I don't think either one of these premises are good for us, frankly. And I guarantee you, whichever one wins will be used against us in the future. I guarantee it will be. This is a, this is a demonic place, I think, for a culture to be in. Grant absolute immunity unconditionally to the most powerful person in government. That lasts forever. No matter what. Or don't. And then declare open lawfare, vengeful litigiousness, real actual insurrection, the likes of which we've never seen forever. Do you like it? Am I missing? Anybody like either one of those options? And at that point, you just, you just, at that point to me, you throw up your hands and you say, Joe Rogan is right. We need Jesus. I, 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 we're out of options. If those are the corners now of where what we're being asked to do, grant a president basically a form of absolute power. In this day and age, with this caliber of humans in the culture, okay? And it lasts forevermore, quoth the raven. Or don't. And, and the lawfare will last forevermore. I don't have an answer or a theory for that one other than pray. And with that, gentlemen, let us segue to Theology Thursday. Because we've essentially been talking yes. these topics this entire time. I think you are watching. The, 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 when, when Aaron, when you asked me le- at the end of that segment last hour about, you know, uh, dates and you were bringing up dates yeah. to be on the ballot, yep. you were talking about taking them off. I was looking at it the other way. See, I'm, I am too. At that, this they, point. that they want to leave him on the ballot so that they can say uh, he's a convicted felon. We tried him and, he conv- and we convicted him. And if he had a ruling June 30th, 90 days after June 30th is still October 1. That's plenty of time to have the, to at least start the trial. Have that. We don't have any no debates this fall. And we just have the trial of insurrectionist Donald Trump going on the entire month instead. Here's the thing. They didn't intend for it to go like this. They wanted this trial to happen in January. 
And then they moved it to Super Tuesday, basically, March 4th, the day before. The way this is going to work out, if they get their wish, is they're going to actually be able to have it at the most malicious time possible. I don't believe natural origins and means can produce these kinds of things. Supernatural ones do. I don't think I don't think humans can be this lucky this many times in a row. I don't think humans are able to keep, you know, keep things on lockdown this many times in a row. I think this stuff happens from the unseen realm. What are your thoughts both on this, but more so and more broadly, the last six weeks of discussion we had on Know Thy Enemy? Well, let's talk about that revival. The only thing that stops this. Uh, that I, I got to commit it to memory because when nefarious talks about demon possession, explaining it fairly early in the movie to James and lays out how it happens. And he, I can't remember. There's five or six stages mm-hmm. landing in subjugation, but he lays it out right and rattles them off. And I, as if to make the, this is clinical. We're not just throwing stuff up against a wall. We know exactly how to do this. Mm-hmm. So, in terms of doing what needs to be done to the average American who ultimately, if the people are the problem, or at some, at some point, the experts aren't going to save us. They need to step up. What is the Mount Rushmore? The four things that if revival happens will be addressed in the hearts of the average American. I don't know if you have to actually just talk about men because I don't think they're the same for men and women. If you, if I just say the average American, I think those are different lists for men. You can disagree and go ahead. Mm-hmm. So answer this however you want. But what is the Mount Rushmore things that fundamentally that reformation um, would address and fix? Repentance. I mean, that's the cornerstone of the, of, of the Christian faith. To paraphrase, but Luke, what's prevent the four thing? What are preventing people now? What's in the way of that? I think repentance. Like, what are the things? What? We, the, let me help you with what you say. At the beginning, it's stealing a toy car. What are our habits, our dispositions right now as sinners? Are, are you in asking this me? So age, I thought you were asking me what a reformation would produce, as a, or a revival no, would produce. What does it have to address? As opposed to, as opposed to, oh well. I know sin, broadly speaking, but specifically in this day and age, how do we do that? That uniquely in this time he he mentioned something stealing a toy toy car but what are our problems right now number one number one god is god and we are not when you when you talk about comfort what you're basically saying is that we have enough freedom and largesse to behave as functional atheists that's basically what you're saying that that we have the the level of, of 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 numbing agents available to us to act as if we are ultimately all powerful. We will determine what we will address and what we will not, when we will address it and when we will not, what we will say yes to and what we will not, what we'll say no to and what we will not, as if none of these things have been predetermined at all. This is why when an event like 9-11 occurs, the churches are full, because that's in a reminder, there are forces at work here beyond our scope, control, and understanding. And then for, and then, but then when you, instead of mobilizing the home front, you tell people NFL games start next week and make sure you go to Costco. Otherwise the, uh, the, uh, the terrorist win and uh, we'll take it from here. Well, you know, that, that, that humility is gone now and you're right back to normal or comfortable. And it's like nine 11 never happened. Okay. So what, what the, what the comfort has done has turned us into functional Functional atheists. So number one, instead of stealing a toy car, we just have too much car. Correct. We have too many cars. Correct. That's one. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We have, we, we, and, and, and therefore we have turned those things into idols. Um, that, that how do I service those things? How do I not risk those things? Okay. That would be number one. And I mean, that, to me, that, that would be like number one, like, um, uh, thriller, was the number one selling album of 1983. And there were other great albums in 1983, but there was only one thriller. I mean, that, that one is like on a, in, on a platform all unto its own, okay? The second thing that I think that would have to be directly confronted would be the weakness of the men. Um, you know, the script, one of the scriptures that talks about what revival looks like, turning the hearts of the fathers to the sons and the hearts of the sons to the fathers, the, addressing the men. The men are the direct 
plumb line of the state of any culture. Even, even in a pagan culture, this is true because the laws of nature and nature's God apply universally. Like the, the laws of nature and nature's God are not canceled out because you don't believe in God or you believe that something that isn't God, a demon or something you made up in your own mind is God. Those are laws that preexisted you. They don't bend to your imagination or negligence or willful ignorance. Which is why even in like, you know, the remaking Shogun, you, you and I talked about yeah, that the other day, yeah. um, you know, the, the Richard Chamberlain original when we were kids was must-see television back in the day. Even in a pagan, Far Eastern culture, the idea of masculine leadership, honor, even those things, they can't outrun the old magic. Maybe, maybe, they, maybe, they, maybe they escape election from a salvation standpoint. But the DNA of the cosmos, okay, you know, Tucker Carlson uses the term the iron law of the universe. That's another good way of describing what I'm talking about. Bends to truth, bends to justice, bends to righteousness. Why? Because who's the creator of the, uh, who's the, creator of the universe? God. Those are his characteristics, right? Mm -hmm. So even in pagan cultures, you can't get around. Even, even if they reject salvation, they cannot get around. Somebody was meant to lead. Someone was meant to be brave. Someone was meant to be courageous. Someone was meant to fight, protect, and defend. Someone was meant to do that. Who were those someones? The men. And I think actually those two would be so overwhelming yeah. in what to address and setting the context for everything else. I'm actually not even sure like what the next two or three things would That's, be can because I, they'd probably be dealt with if we dealt with those two things, unless agreed. you have something, Aaron. I, I Agreed. I, I'd like to take a stab at this just off the top of my head. I think these are the four cornerstones, the Mount Rushmore of what would need to be addressed after or during or... These are the things that would happen during a real revival. Number one, and in this order. Number one, humility. Number two, in, intolerance. I'll get more to, on that in just a minute. Uh, humility, intolerance, accountability, and posterity. Number one, humility. In the supernatural or spiritual sense. What you just said, Steve, God is God and I am not. A recognition of that. That is the very first step and that's the hardest step. Uh, easier to, what is it, uh, for the camel to pass through an eye of the needle than for the rich man to get into heaven. I think mm -hmm. that's what it is. Mm -hmm. We're all the rich man. Humility. That sounds easy. It is not. It is not. That has to do everything with, uh, to do with the comfort that Todd talks about because we are all the rich man. Number two, intolerance. We are no longer going to suffer evils while they are sufferable, a la the Declaration of Independence. Mm -hmm. Evil is no longer sufferable to us at a granular, molecular level. Number three, which leads to accountability. We are going to hold those accountable at a granular, molecular level, accountable for perpetrating evil because it is no longer sufferable to us. And posterity, while we're doing all of these things, we're going to be building systems in place for future generations so that they don't have to go through that first step, hopefully, or that they, they are maybe birthed into that first step from the word go of humility, the recognition that God is God and I am not. So that's off the top of my head. That's maybe a Mount Rushmore of, of revival, what that looks like. That's good. I yield, uh, I defer to the, uh, the gentleman from, uh, from Iowa with that answer. That's a very good answer. So go ahead, Todd. No, I was just to your point, Steve, about I think if you just take care of two. See, this conversation, it's, it's not actually complex. There's, we are without excuse. There's not, this isn't calculus where I, but it is hard. Just like Aaron said, it's first, it's incredible. It's clearly incredibly hard and it's getting harder. The more reason we have to get on our knees and say, thank you that we have all these blessings. Correct. Those, 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 those blessings are killing us because we don't honor the one who gave them to us. Yep. That's exactly right. We put the faith in the blessings rather than the blesser. And, you know, small group last night, we watched uh, Eric Metaxas's letter from an American church. We'll probably talk about it next week sometime. And afterwards, uh, one of the gals in the, our small group, she said, you know, the reason we don't stand up, uh, Jenny said, the reason we don't stand up is because we look at all the things we have that, that God gave us and we are just stewards of, even our 
our marriages, even our children, Mm -hmm. our shelter, everything. These are all things God gave us that we are just stewards of. But we behave as if they are really actually our own. We're not leasing them. Correct. We own them. And therefore, we have to protect and defend them at all costs. Um, And I I looked and I said, I'm going to steal that, use it on my show. And I did the very next day just now because I think that that is a very profound observation. Are we leasing or are we owning? These, these three kids that, you know, Amy and I are about to send the third one off to the world next year after he graduates from high school. We love them dearly, but they're not our children. God used her eggs and my sperm, but, but he's the one who made them. He counted the hairs on their head. They belong to him. And, and we'll go into eternity or not. We'll, as, we will not go as father and son and father and daughter. We will go into eternity together or not as brother and sister and brother and brother. Noah will be my brother, not my son. Anna and Zoe will be my sister, not my daughters. Because ultimately, they're his. And I'd kill for them. But they're ultimately not mine. And we don't behave that way. Most of our churches are passive in the face of evil. Well, I collected these people. My, my, my winsomeness, my slamming praise team mm-hmm. uh, uh, accumulated this crowd, not the Holy Spirit. No, and, you're leasing them. And not coincidentally, the imposter gods, the state, the blue-haired uh, groomer, tranny teacher, they all think that they, that's why they don't want your kids mm-hmm. to belong to you either. Mm-hmm. But they're coming from the exact opposite premise. They're destroyers, not creators. Correct. Effectively, the message, I believe, of this study is from 1 John 4. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. That's effectively the message. And, and in 1 John, how does that passage that I just quoted, or that, that verse that I just quoted at the end of, how does that passage start? It says, little children. Yeah. Little children. Whether it's the slam and praise team or the... The way we do things at this particular church in order to outreach to the community, it's just so special. One, that's a, that's a pride issue. And two, if, even, if it, even if the motivation were true, we're putting a burden on ourselves that is not ours. Mm-hmm. It's the Holy Spirit's job to work within people's lives. We are to be like little children, relying every, on, on everything, for everything, on God the Father. We take too much that doesn't belong to us, and in trying to outreach to the world, we become like the world and effectively neuter ourselves. Be like little children. Amen. For a decade now, Patriot Mobile has been at the vanguard of helping to create America's parallel economy as America's really last remaining American mobile phone company left. If you want to make the switch today, you will not regret it. They have an outstanding U.S.-based customer service team. Uh, That means you can understand them. Uh, They will customize uh, a plan for you or your family. Um, or your business as, as much as they can possibly do so. You'll get to keep phones, change phones, upgrade them if you want, keep your number, get a new one if you want. You'll also get access to all three of the major networks out there, and you can switch anytime you want for free. Um, they support the same values that you do. So you don't have to directly con- you have to directly fund your enemies any longer. And they love to reward veterans and first responders. So if you're going to make the switch today, let them know that you're one of those. They've got extra ways to say thank you for your service. Everyone can just use my name, Steve, though, to make the switch and get a free activation with the offer code Steve at PatriotMobile.com slash Steve. Offer code Steve at PatriotMobile.com slash Steve. And with that, it is time for three non-political questions. We all have questions. Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? Who am I? A search and a question of identity. Why am I here? A question of meaning and purpose. Where am I going? Question of destiny. Some better than others. What sort of morality or proto-morality would you expect to find in a chimpanzee troop? Injecting some levity into the demise of Western civilization. It's three questions on The Steve Day Show. And get a good look at her. It might be a minute or two before you see her again. 
Our oldest daughter, Anastasia, is here. Her water could literally break right here on the set, and that would be something. Please don't let that happen, actually, now that I said that out loud. I'll try to hold it in. (laughs) See, what you don't know, (laughs) unless you have uh, been with a woman who's been pregnant, or you are said woman, Anna has reached that stage of pregnancy now where she's about to pop and doesn't care what you think, and is just completely unfiltered, and is just... Um, she came to just drop bombs. Everything is just a, you know, is that fair? That's fair. One of the reasons zero, I, zero F's given. Is that what the young kids say today? That's kind of where you are, right? One of the reasons I told you that I think this should be my last week, even if I'm still pregnant next week is because I was like, I don't think anybody's going to want to be around me if that's the case. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be very grumpy. So you are technically due on Sunday. Yes. All right. So we're all hoping, though, that uh, tomorrow's the big day because that's March 1st. And that mm-hmm. was your, you know, your late grandfather. That was his birthday. So that'd be some pretty cool serendipity. I am, by the way, can I ask maybe a, a non-political question? All right. I'm in favor of whatever day the baby is born. Just telling Autumn her birthday was March 1st. Is, and, and that way it, it, it's commemorative. Is there something wrong with that? Is that like a dude code violation? Just lying? <laughs> Looking at the looks on the set, <laughs> I am ashamed. All right, so what? What? <laughs> I was just kidding. Oh wow, you're just, just joking. Full of the jokes. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yes. Grandpa's gonna be something out here yanking chains. That's what I do. Yeah, gotcha. Alex Stein, look out. Yes. All right. So, uh, what are your three non-political questions? All right. Let's let's just get this guy. So my. <laughs> question for you is if you could create your own social media platform what would it be oh man um everyone has to speak in gifts only you can say whatever you want provided you're not you know directly physically threatening somebody or advocating the harming of children and uh um but you got to speak in a gif you do like gifts. I you do. have reached that age. I do. I do like where you communicate a lot in gifts. I do. I do. So basically, a twenty-first <laughs> century digitized version of Egyptian hiero- hieroglyphics. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. what it, we're saying. It, it, first, there's a couple things that it does. One, it gets creative. Two, it makes you kind of pause for a second. How much can I communicate? Yeah, because you've got to find the right gift, right? So you got to pause for a second before you knee jerk. You know, ready, fire, aim. Which, frankly, I do too often, if I'm being honest. Um, you know, so it get it, it both creates. Um, some uh, some patience, and then also some creativity. So you can only speak in gifts. What? I, that one was good. No, I just you're right. Now that I'm now you're just here, judging me. <laughs> now that I am sitting here, and I was like, I'm really not that judgmental. But now that I'm sitting here, I really am in that judgmental mood. All right, Todd, what do you have? So you're, you're at the whole platform, like Facebook, something. Yeah. Like- what gave you this idea so I can help me answer it? No, I was just on Twitter and it honestly, I was listening to the show at the same time and just thinking about how cool it would be if we had the ability to create our own social media. And then I started thinking about what I would create. And then I was like, that's, and then I was like, I have a job to do tomorrow. And then I wrote down this question. Uh, well, I don't. <laughs> An entire platform, that, that that's tough. But, I mean, I, I think it's pretty obvious that I would focus on... I actually... T- how could I have a sports program telling everybody... Uh, teaching everybody that you, they're loving sports the wrong way? Because they are. So, But I don't know how to do that and monetize it. Because they would hate me and they wouldn't listen. And they really need to listen because most of the people who love sports love it for all the wrong reasons. So... I think it's That's just a I website, do. just one page, a one page website with Todd's head animated, <laughs> his, like mouth o- going up and down, just saying repent <laughs> and soap operas for men over and over again. Love it. Nice. I'm sure nobody's ever had this idea before, but my social media platform would be a website, a video only platform, either no captions or very few captions, no hashtags. And it's a video platform, but the videos are capped, a hard cap. All of them are capped at six seconds a piece. And I would I would name it after like some sort of leafy, fast growing um, plant. Like I would Mm. call it vine or something like that. And uh, that, that would be mine because I imagine that the amount of creativity 
that you could pack into a six second video when you knew that that was all that you had to deal with, to work with. This sounds familiar. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's what I would do. That's what I would do. You should get on that. Yeah. Should I name it? What should I name it? I think I like using Vine. Vine, Vine I think is a clever term. Yeah. Vine. Yeah. That sounds I it was good. Yeah, yeah. That sounds good. All right. My next question for you okay. guys is how do we engage Christians and what's going on? And why do you think they find it so easy to stay out of it? Other than the obvious where it can be comfortable to not be confrontational. I understand that. But maybe it's just because I'm so wired like you. I just don't understand how you see certain things and you don't at least say something or engage like a little bit. Do you know what I'm saying? It's a great question. Um, the, the created order that God established operates on a principle known as headship. And, and this is so that there can be a chain of command. Okay. And so, as I've talked about many times over the years, when the Bible declares a, the husband is the head of the home, it does not mean that he is the primary authority in the home. God is the primary authority in the home. It means that the husband has the primary responsibility for seeing that authority carried out. He's the first in the chain of delegated command. God is the authority. Okay, so if you're like, a, I've used this example before. The husband comes home uh, after, you know, uh, binge watching Breaking, Breaking Bad and says, I think we're going to get into the drug, de- the drug dealing business. Should the wife follow the husband because the husband is the head of the home and say, oh, well, you know, let's, let's get working on that. She Probably should, not. No, <laughs> she should follow God. Okay, because the authority in the home is God. The husband is the primary responsibility for the carrying out of that authority. This principle works everywhere. You know, I've used this example. When companies like Enron or Lehman Brothers went under for corruption, uh, shady deals and business practices, did the people in the mailroom, were they making those decisions? Were the, were the people that worked in the clerical positions, were they making those decisions? Were the, the people who worked in virtually any department other than the ones that were directly determining the company's, um, you know, modus operandi, the va- how many, what percentage of those employees were involved in the shady business dealings of that company? Not many. Most of them probably making somewhere between 40 to 150 grand a year. Okay, but they all lost their jobs because the people at the top who were making those decisions behaved poorly. That's the principle of headship. Okay, so how does that relate to your question? Without the heads of the ministry, you cannot. No, or you know, we always we we always talk about how conservative the grassroots on the in the Republican Party is. It's irrelevant. Doesn't matter if they're not party chairman, president, governor. You know, Senator, the, the people that are actually making the decisions, doesn't matter. They're not, that's the principle of headship. And so you have to, you reach them through the people God appointed to reach them. And that's, the, that's what the pastor, is, that's what the clergy is supposed to do. And without them, you cannot. It's impossible. You can, you'll, you'll have independent pockets of people that will do this on their own, form independent groups, you know, like in the Tea Party era, like the nine, 12 groups that were formed and stuff like that. But they won't be able to sustain themselves as a longstanding substitute as, it, it, as hard as they work and as earnest as their efforts are. Because we're, we, have to, we have to abide by the principle of, the, of headship. That's the created order. And if the head is bad, so will everything else be systemically. You may have exceptions that can hold out. But systemically, if the head is bad, everything else will be. Todd? Well, it's worse than you think, Anna. I mean, there's the, the, the comfort of people just not wanting to rock the boat. They're scared of what might people say. But there's all kinds of people that are, don't have, they love the conflict. They'll bring stuff that up, but they're just as ineffective in getting anything accomplished than the people who won't stand up and do anything because ultimately they do have things when it comes to doing acts. We talked about this yesterday. Do we, do we, Daniel limits about it all the time. We have things that are way more important to us than actually accomplishing the thing. Money, access, hobbies, things that get in the way. So we want, for, and really, and it's not just politicians because there's, especially all the people say, oh, I hate the politicians. Oh, you have the exact same problem as the politicians. And trust me, it's a, 
For example, the Christian is, oh, it's really important to get your kid baptized. Okay. Uh, but I'll give you, I'll give you a million bucks if you don't baptize your kid for a year. Offer. Just go to any Christian randomly. What are they going to do? I think if we pause for a second, the awfulness of that answer is all you need to know. There's just things at the end of the, even if they say, theoretically, no, when you present it to them, there's all manner of things that are more important to people than the thing that they say is important when it really comes down to it. I'll just repeat what I said earlier this week. You know, when you when you see individuals who you would expect to be not woke, but awake to the world around them, and they're still either ineffective, unwilling or unable to take action or just ignorant. Um, you have to do the inverse of Thanos and say, fine, I'll do it myself, regardless of the leadership. And Steve, that that doesn't that doesn't dilute Steve's point, because ultimately the leadership within any congregation is probably going to end up in most circumstances having the most sway on that uh, organization. But you befriend people who you're, for whatever reason, aware of or may suspect that they're not really uh, taking uh, taking their duty as uh, father and citizen seriously. You befriend them and you disciple them yourselves. You do the inverse of the Thanos. He's the bad guy, of course. He's a big ba bad. You be the big good and just say, fine, I'll do it myself. I'll take this burden upon myself. I think that's one way to do, to do this. But ultimately, what Steve said at the outset is is true. Before we get to question three, a reminder about our friends over at Hillsdale. They are trying to do something about our national crisis in civic education over the last generation as we have essentially had our cultural heritage just hijacked from us. And this is why 18 to 30 year olds are the most likely to reject patriotism, look at the founding fathers as villains, uh, re reject things such as God given rights, uh, uh, support things like removal of historical statues, um, including even up to George Washington and Teddy Roosevelt. So Hillsdale College wants to do something about this. They have produced a series of 60 second radio spots called Constitution Minutes. Just short, kind of like what you were describing with that uh, new app you came up with, uh, Vine, a little while ago, Aaron. Yeah. Uh, and uh, just, you know, short, clear, concise lessons uh, on the principles of liberty and the first principles of our country. Um, if you want to hear a Constitution Minute, and then hopefully you'll share it with a young person that you know, visit uh, daceforhillsdale.com. That's dace, D-E-A-C-E, daceforhillsdale.com. Again, that's daceforhillsdale.com. And you can also get a free pocket Constitution while you're there as well at daceforhillsdale.com. All right. Third and final question, sweetie. All right. Last question. What is one piece of parenting advice you have for me as I go into this hopefully very soon new chapter? Authenticity with your kids. Um, I, I, looking back on it now, there, you are going to make mistakes in front of your kid. You're, you're just, it's unavoidable. You're human. And what you're going to learn is autumn is a little... Well, we used to call them camcorders. What do we call them now? She's just she's just recording things the minute she becomes self-aware, okay? And and your kids are the most convicting things God can put in your path about showing you uh, your own weaknesses. And I don't know how much you remember this. I mean, when you were little, you know, when I screwed up, like I'd get down on one knee and look at you and I'd apologize and say, hey, mm -hmm. I, I forgive me. I, I was wrong. I shouldn't have done that. OK, I, I think authenticity with your children, you're not going to be perfect. Don't even attempt it. But when you blow it, own it. OK, and, and not just with them. When you blow it with their dad, own that. You know, if you if you lost your temper with somebody, uh, you know, at Walmart or something, own it. And, and I think that that that's the number one weapon the enemy uses to drive a wedge between us and our children is our own unconfronted hypocrisy that is particularly in this era in which we live in which people are putting their you know personal lives and um and and personal struggles out there in the open on social media and stuff for things to see more than ever before authenticity i think matters now more than ever before that would be my best advice uh th this is going to be hard but it's a must because that sweet little face and especially if they are generally well-behaved and good and all this stuff, but punish them. 
It's, it's the most tired. That that's because that means you really, finish them. <laughs> yes, that, that means you love them. Make sure that they understand there are consequences and don't. It's, and I don't know necessarily what Steven's disposition is, but this is his job. And if he sees fit to do it, and that makes you a little uncomfortable, you just need to be uncomfortable because that's definitely his job. They need to understand, even if they are pretty darn good little girls, that there are consequences for sin. And you're doing them, you're giving them a gift by doing that young and not letting them get to the age of 18 and not understand that. Mm hmm. I think the biggest thing that I could say so far is children are God's blessing to you, but they are not for you. They do not belong to you. I think that reframes everything a la the way that Todd is talking about there. They are not yours. They belong to him. And you have to reset that almost every single day. Well, sweetie, hopefully we won't see you for another few months. I hope not. All right. <laughs> We're going to stick around and do overtime for Blaze TV subscribers. For the rest of you, we'll see you tomorrow, noon to 2 Eastern, after Glenn Beck, Romans 828.